Do you remember the first story that was so spellbinding that it drove you to break the rules and stay up all night? To keep reading, keep listening, keep playing? So good you forgot your life and lived there? So good that the moment it ended you asked yourself, what next? Welcome to the floor. Our goal is to take you back, take you deeper, to explore and understand more, and relive that childlike wonder. Join us as we dive deep into humanity's greatest stories, no matter how they are told, through books, movies, television, even games. One of us does an in-depth research on our topic. One of us is familiar with the topic. And one of us knows nothing. So the right questions will always be asked and will be addressed for anyone coming into the topic, regardless of how much you know. Enjoy another world, another adventure, another spellbinding story. Join us on the floor. Welcome back. We are in the campaign setting of Eberron again, talking about House Caneth. Uh, we've done a couple of episodes on this and uh, kind of covered all the history, what happened uh, in the morning, the day of the morning, uh, and the fallout of that, and the treaty that was signed, and I think we're going to start getting into more of a modern House Caneth and talking about the three different uh, current leaders of the now three separate pieces of House Caneth. We have Merix. Zorlang. Wait, recap real quick. Yeah, you were the expert once. You are the expert <laughs> for this one. <laughs> Now, I'm the expert for this one. Joe's the expert for this Oh, okay. One. You are the amateur, and I am the know-nothing. Just making yeah. sure people listening, <laughs> and apparently me, know who's who. <laughs> uh, and, and we also want to welcome our new Patreon, Josh. Thanks yes. Thank you, Josh. Yeah. Thank you, Josh. Hopefully, you listen to this episode, and you love it. Um, and if you don't, then uh, you're wrong. Well, nah. blame Kieran. Right. Blame Kieran. Yes, it's Kieran's <laughs> fault. I don't know why, but yeah. It's but, well, because he requested these, right? Oh, yes. 100%. <laughs> Kieran, this is on you. If anyone dislikes these episodes, because of Kieran. <laughs> so. All right. Uh, yes. So we talked about uh, kind of the history of House Caneth through the last war. And then we talked about the schism and we covered what was called uh, Caneth South. So today we'll be covering Wait, the schism. Yeah, well, after that was in the a, religion one, they couldn't pick a lead. A schism is when you have any single group that divides into different things, right? Oh, okay. So we yeah. had we had two schisms. Huh. So one in the we religion. Had schism, we had a religion schism, and we had a uh, argument of power schism. So we had schisms left and right. Just schism, schism, schism. schism. Yeah. Right. yeah. So after the day of mourning, we get a schism within House Canaan, and it becomes three different houses. Uh huh. Schism. So is we such talked a about Canaan South and Merrix. So now we're going to talk about Caneth West. So Caneth West is so led by... Merix is the grandson of the creator of the Warforged. Yes. Or so, inventor, if you will. Yeah, so Merix has no claim to leadership of House Caneth. He is made a leader because he is a brilliant artificer and he is descended from the creator of the Warforged, right? Mm, okay. like that is why people follow Merix. So in Caneth West, we have Jorlana de Caneth, and she has the strongest claim to the leadership of House Caneth. The strongest bloodline, right? Yeah, strongest bloodline claim to to the leadership. So she is the daughter of the second wife of the heir of House Caneth. So that is is the single closest connection we have after the day of mourning. Because everyone else is dead. Everyone else is dead, yeah. Yeah. How and third? Sorry, what was that, Aaron? Well, and third, you said there was three. Who's third? So well, that's Canis East. We'll cover Canis East after. So yeah, oh, dang it, I was so excited. I was so. so excited. Yeah. So now the reason how Canis is divided, with everyone recognizing Jorlana is clearly most likely to be the leader. Like you've definitely got the bloodline connection. Yeah. Is because she's made some bad choices that we're going to talk about when she was younger. And so people are like, we don't know if we want to follow you. You don't have a good track record. Right. She she broke a big rule. She broke. She's broken a couple. So oh, she, OK. Well, so, I know of the one. All right. So when she was younger, 
she fell in love with an heir of House Denise. That's a house we haven't covered yet, but it is a dragon marked house. Yeah. And so to hope in hoping to quell the romance, they were separated, right? Because we know what happens if you get two dragon marked individuals from different aberrant houses. marks. Yeah, do aberrant, you want aberrant marks. marks? This yes. is how you get aberrant, aberrant marks. marks. Exactly. You want aberrant marks. This is how you get aberrant marks. So they, they first they try to separate them, and then the two elope, and they disappear for a whole year. Yeah. And at the end of the year, the heir of House Denath is missing. And Jorlana returns to House Canis. Now, there are a few rumors about what happens in this void of, of people. And the, the, the most common uh, and most likely of the rumors is that the heir is actually assassinated early on within this time period. Mm. And, and she was just in hiding. And she was pregnant. Oh. And they had to wait until the child was born before she could come back. Because then people would automatically be able to say, that's, yeah. yeah. You have an aberrant child. Yes. Uh Yeah. 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 So that's part of her past. And part of the reason people are like, "Uh, we don't know if you should uh, be leading House Caneth at this moment. Right, right. (laughs) You, You might have a child who's growing up right now who might have the power to destroy everything. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you you, you might have child. birthed the Antichrist, so we're kind <laughs> of on the fence. <laughs> you're leading everyone. Okay. Other than that, your resume looks great. So, yes, but she is a very diplomatic leader, and we'll, we'll go into some of the things she's done uh, with Kenneth West. Um, so, but even now, it, as she... It is, le- it oh, is uh, Kenneth East and West that's connected by the lightning morale, right? Uh yes. Yeah. So, however, uh, Canis South is in Sharn, which is the largest city on all of Kovir. Right, right. So, yes. Yeah. So, um, as she is currently leading House uh, Canis West at the moment, she is having an affair with a young scion from House Orion, which is another dragon marked house. What is with her? A uh, young scion? Yeah, that's just it. Scion is just his position in the house, and he's just younger than she is. Well, that's the color okay. he is. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so House Orion. So Orion is the mark of tra- of travel. So that's their dragon heart and mouse, and and we will get around to doing a whole episode on House Orion as well. So right. he was probably like hitting on her, and he was like, "Hey, well, hang on, it's about to get twisted." Wait, wait, let me let me let me do my my pun. He was like, no. "This is down to <laughs> travel." He was like, "Hey." Do you need a ride? <laughs> I do need a ride. That it, it, I feel like everyone from how everyone from like age sixteen to twenty two in House Orion. That's how they hit on girls. They're like, "Hey, need a ride?" <laughs> and they're like, "Get from House Orion." You guys have oh no power. <laughs> it's like it's just like the like the biker dudes or something. Eventually, I think when the the dragon like, might get strong enough, they just teleport. <laughs> Yeah, they would, cool. they would just teleport. So anyway, so she's having an affair with him. Uh, however, he is not actually a member of House Orion. He is a Rakasha from the Lords of Dust Ooh. in disguise. Isn't that so an I, Italian dish? I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go into all of what that means. Okay, it's uh, a tiger people. Yes, a Rashaka. Yeah. So essentially, they're humanoid tigers. So they look like people, but they've got. Tiger hands and tiger heads and then fur and stripes like tigers, tails, everything. Yeah. Now, the Rashaka is a type of demon. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we did it way back in some of our early Eberron, Eberron episodes. We talked about the age of demons where the demons were bound. And most of the Rashakas were bound at that time. But there was a small few that escaped the binding. Yeah. And they have formed a secret organization called the Lords of Dust. And the Lords of Dust goal is to free the demons from the dragon's binding. Yeah. Most specifically, the Rashaka Lords. Oh, I'm sorry, the, Rash- the Rashaka uh, Rajas, which are demon overlords. Yeah. Those who are the people but they want to free the most. It's from the Quaddle. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, when the dragons. dragons but yeah. Quaddles are the ones holding them. Yeah, Quaddles are the ones holding them. Yeah. So, yeah, so currently 
Like, so if somebody finds out she's in a relationship with someone from House Orion, she could easily be thrown out of power. But if someone finds out that it's actually Rashaka who works for the Lords of Dust, they've got much bigger problems. Be like, are you kidding? Like, the leader of our organization is being controlled by a puppet. (laughs) Who also might have an aberrant Mark's son. Yeah. That she's hiding. Like, yeah. Like, Like, you can see that. Written all over. You know, like, regardless of how good a leader Jordana is, you can see why people are like, but you've done some stuff. (laughs) (laughs) You don't make good choices. Like, we wish it was somebody else. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So is that clear, Aaron? You you have an understanding here? She uh, is basically any politician ever. (laughs) And and what's her name again? No, no, no. This is this is like Yolanda. Let, let's just say you've got a you've got a senator and he's got a mistress and it's like it's bad no one should find out he has a mistress but then it's like no no his mistress is actually called or a spy for the soviet union Be like oh no no that's far worse that's far worse <laughs> i feel like she's just a politician <laughs> she's just a politician so okay I'm saying all right so uh, Jorlana uh, chose the city of Fairhaven in Andwar to try and rebuild Kanith, um, as this was the nation she had worked with the most during the last war. This is Jorlana. So, uh, yeah, Jorlana. So, okay, she's so like, we have Jorlana. This is she's the west. Yes, Kanith mm-hmm. west. And then, and then Kanith south is Mugawuga Merix. Yep, Mugawuga yeah. for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Merix. Okay, yeah. So uh, I'll cover these really quickly. So Andar is one of the original uh, five nations um, of the Empire of Galifar. And at the end of the last war, its territory was divided, uh, creating what's called the Elden Reaches. And it's kind of like a nature preserve and a place for druids. <laughs> and then uh, another chunk of it was given to a different nation called Thrain. And the reason behind this was an attempt to balance the power, right? The, the last war put everyone in a stalemate, but the reason everyone was at war was because they assumed they could beat each other. So at the Treaty of Thronehold, they're like, let's make sure that you know it'll be a stalemate if you start a war again. And so certain pieces of, of, of uh, the nations were broken up to make sure you knew going in, it would be stalemate. Right. Interesting. So like, this is, this is kind of the, the whole idea behind the treaty of world war one, right? World war one. Before that, we had a ton of treaties in place. And the whole point of the treaties was like, you can't start a war with anyone because you'll start a war with everyone. Right. And then right. somebody was like, we're going to start a war anyway. And it started a war with everyone. Uh-huh. uh-huh. Somebody. <laughs> yeah, Germany. <laughs> so, well, actually, it was the, the assassin group, right? The Black Hand. They're the ones who started it. In, in D&D? No, no, World War I. Oh, I don't right? know about They, the they assassinated Hand. the Archduke. I don't know about See, that. See, that's just a conspiracy. <laughs> that's just a, it was a conspiracy, <laughs> and they succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> that actually happened. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, anyways, what do we? Uh, let's we can yeah, take a so, short break here. Oh, okay. Wow, um, get that fast. <laughs> what are we going to be talking about in the second half? Uh, we'll cover a little bit more about Andwar and the city of Fairhaven, just to have a little bit better understanding of Kenneth West, and then we'll talk about Kenneth East and the very dark things they do. Finally. Okay, so we have been mentioning at the end of our episodes recently about the treasure room, how, as Aaron likes to describe it, in the floor we go deep into things, but in the treasure room we kind of go wide. And we wanted to give people who have never been in the treasure room a a little bit of a sample. So going forward, we'll probably be uh, putting in little bits and pieces here. So here is a small clip uh, from the treasure room. We hope you enjoy it and are interested in uh, learning more in there. How is uh, Arbitron? Yeah. yeah, what's Arbitron? Well, we know name? we know how necromancy works, right? Well, you don't have to kill them. You just need dead people. He just works at a graveyard. Like this is part time job. No, no, no. So the leader about this, and right? works at a graveyard. 
so the lore of necromantic uh necromancy like not not how not 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 game mechanics but lore of function yeah is that to create undead you need negative energy oh yeah you have to kill yeah that's true and the way you get negative energy is you kill something and trap the escaping life force yeah it's a skyrim with the soul gems yeah there you go right Right. So like I said, that's not the mechanics of when you play the game, but that is the lore of how it is and why it is so forbidden. It's like, we don't want you walking around killing people to fund your spells. No. Uh, yeah. Well, so, maybe he just like hires people to like, do you think he gets like soul gems, takes them to a battlefield, sucks up the dead people <laughs> as they die, brings them back for later. You know, well, I think during the last war, you're right. They probably didn't have to make sacrifices. And be like, just be ready to catch anything that dies out here. Yeah. But well, now they're, they're like, not if, at war. But what if, what if, like they had, they created something. All right, welcome back. Uh, we just finished covering uh, a bunch of uh, Kenneth. West and uh, Jolana. Yes, uh, Jolana. Jolana and uh, uh, her dark past. And uh, now we're doing, uh, what was it? Fairhaven and... Yeah. What yeah. race right. are these guys? What is Human. Uh, the Dragon Mark of Making Sun Humans. So. Yeah. Okay. All right. And then last Fairhaven? episode, we had talked about South for a little bit with... <clears throat> Merix. Merix. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, yeah. So uh, in her diplomatic relationships, she has connected some of these druids and their sex and is working with them as well. Uh, it's just just part of her expanding her influence and power within mm-hmm. the, the, the sphere that she has. Control. Is it like the gatekeepers or? No, because the gatekeepers are in the, the shadow marshes, right? Because they're oh, orcs, right. okay. so these yeah. are these are different. So there, there, I believe there's six different groups of druids in the Elden Reaches, and mm-hmm. she has currently contacted and is working with the wardens of the wood, which okay. is a specific group of druids. But yeah, the gate creepers, they're they're the orcs down in the shadow marches, marshes. Right. right. So okay. Yes. All right. So yeah, and then the Fairhaven is the capital of Ondar, and that's just where Caneth West is centered. So. In earlier episodes, we talked about, uh, you know, Canis would be like, you know, there's an iron shortage and different things like that. But mm-hmm. you can't pull that anymore because it's like, well, I will talk to Canis West and see what they have to say. Or I'll talk to Canis East, see see how their oh. iron's doing. Oh, I'll be like, wait, wait, wait. They're doing the thing Canis did to Canis. <laughs> to Canis. Well, no, How's I it feel? This, I think this removes any favors because if, if Canis tries to tack on a favor – with the thing you want, then you're like, well, let's just go to the other house. Be like, ah, oh, dang it, capitalism gets you well, every no, time. Because, because you're gonna be what talking to Kenneth, Monopoly. Turns into you're gonna be talking to Kenneth West and be like, hey, I like doing business with you, but I mean, <laughs> I might have to talk to Kenneth East. I just, yeah, like, I have him on the phone right now. Now I have him on the phone right now. Uh, they told me they give it to me for thirty percent less than <laughs> what you're saying. You know what? I don't <laughs> want to bother they, you. They Sounds walk like you in with like. Me. With with uh, two gnomes in tow, and they're like, "What are the gnomes for?" <laughs> Be like, these guys are talking to Kane of East and West right now, just to make sure I get the best mm-hmm. deal. Of them. <laughs> I can... right. I'd love to work with you, but uh, what's in it for me? <laughs> That's funny. Is this first, yeah. man? All right. So now we will go to Kane of East. So, All right. like Merix, uh, Zorlan doesn't really have a claim to the leadership. Of Caneth through a bloodline, but he did not want to follow Jorlana. Wait, Zoran? Zorlan. 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 Zorlan, Merix, and Jorlanda. Yeah. And he's more of a, a, a bureaucrat market kind of guy, right? Uh, from what I read uh, and, and his choices, I think he's very military focused. Is he? Oh, okay. okay. So uh, the, at the Treaty of Thronehold, the Warforged are banned. And it's pretty clear that Merix doesn't care. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, like, you're not going to ban my family's greatest achievement? <laughs> Bring this back. <laughs> um, and so Zorlan was not interested in following Merix because he's like, you know, I think it's not a good idea to break the, the Treaty of Thronehold. We have, you know, five powerful nations, four of which would be willing to enforce that treaty on you. Mm-hmm. Right? 
and Zorlana just makes bad choices. I'm not down with that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so Zorlan was in charge uh, of the siege engine developing artificers within King. Oh. And so when he chose to go his own way, they followed him. Hmm. And he went to a very small outpost that Kaneth had in Karnath. And the reason he chose Karnath is that during the last war, Karnath used the undead, right? Necromancy Hmm. is forbidden pretty much everywhere. However, in Karnath, the military is allowed to use necromancy. And Zorlan looked at the undead and he said, there's enough similarity with the Warforged. He says that we could make a kind of hybrid. Undead, so we do not violate the Treaty of Thronehold, but as capable as Warforged. Interesting. And so that is why he chose to go to Karnath, is that he believed he could claim leadership of all Canaan simply by might. He says, we have brought back Warforge 2.0, if you will. And now we can do what we want. So there's zombies with like metal? So we've moved like metal? Cyber zombies. So the, the biggest uh, obstacle to the undead is actually getting them the level of intelligence that the Warforged had in, in right. functioning. Right? That's the biggest that obstacle. Full sentience. Back yeah. up. I asked a question. So not zombies. <laughs> they're, they're not zombies. Are they made out of metal? Uh, well, they would still be undead. What he's what he's working on is the intelligence problem. How do we get them to be more intelligent? Because okay, so they're, put so they're, armor they're zombie them. bodies, uh, and then you just put armor on them. They're not like a husk. So uh, well, you're not like I, melting metal onto them or anything. I don't know if we ever released our skeleton episode, but we talked about how you can really just like mix and match. Or not match and just mix, <laughs> right? To kind of make anything you want. Didn't we talk about like some really cool warship or something made out of dragon bones? Yes, yeah. Or I think think about this: be like a, a, a Roman legion, right? You had your shield wall in front, stabbing with their short swords. The row behind had javelins stabbing over them, and then the row back had like uh, short spears that they would hurl at the enemy. And then behind that, you had the archers. He says, "What if we just give them?" Um, eight sets of arms and they can do all of that by themselves on the front row. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that. But, uh, okay, also, so that's what they're doing with zombies. So like uh, to cast necromancy, you need that uh, life force. Yeah. Um, which, which is often drawn from the realm of the dead uh, to use uh, necromancy magic. Yeah. So, uh, so his current plans involve warlocks and necromancers working together. Uh, like they haven't reached fruition, but that's what he's working on. Combining his artificer techniques with uh, warlocks and their eldritch energy and necromancers raising the dead. And he's like, I think we can do this. And then he just gives them blocks to put in holes and, and just test their knowledge. And test. Their- <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. And- yeah. You see the little skeleton? You like it? Uh, this goes in the round hole, the like square hole. Shoot him. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> you know, his head explodes. Be like, next. <laughs> circle goes in which hole? <laughs> and mm-hmm. the skeleton just looking at it, looking at the hole, looking at it. Be like, too slow. Next. <laughs> Starts chewing on his hand. <laughs> Starts chewing on his hand. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's why uh, Zorlan chose to go to Karnath. And uh, what his plans are there. So because he, he believes, right, it's a loophole in the Treaty of Stonehold. They won't be warforged. They're undead. I think his answer is uh, the Null Witherlings. <laughs> I, I think that's where he's got to go. So, Oh, but they're too chaotic. <laughs> yeah, they are chaotic. They're not soldiers. So, yes. Now, uh, Car- so in... In in uh, in Karnath, House Kaneth East has really fully embraced the culture there. They're a very militaristic society, right? Uh, so either you could think like Napoleon or you could think ancient Rome. Like the Roman okay. emperors yeah. were just former generals, right? Yeah. yeah. And so that's very much what we have going on in Karnath is that it is essentially a general king who rules the nation and he runs it like a military operation. Yeah. And uh, they do worship the blood of bull. And so very briefly, the blood of bull. Here's, here's like the one sentence on it. Uh, they do not worship any specific deity, 
but rather the divine within their own blood. So the idea is in D&D, mm-hmm. anyone can become God, right? You can achieve Godhood if you get enough followers, right? And so the idea is instead of worshiping a deity, we worship the collective divinity within all of us. Oh, interesting. And, and thus okay. it is the blood of Vol, the blood of all the people. Um, I believe I believe the exact translation is the blood of Vol is the blood of the living, right? Oh. Um, Okay. Interesting. So I like that. Um, but yeah. So <laughs> we will do a full episode on the blood of bull next month. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah. So Karnath uh, is the oldest of the five nations. This was where Galifar started and spread out as it conquered all of Kovir. So Galifar is what? Galifar was the nation that then broke up into the five nations that then started the last war. Okay, so you, so had, five you had King Galifar who conquered the world. Okay. And then so the Mongols, he, had, got it. He, he had five sons who, instead of respecting uh, each other's borders, all wanted to control all of Galifar themselves. So they went to war and we had the last war. Yeah. yeah. And then after the last war, that's where everyone's at now. Yeah, that's where everyone's of, at. Oh, now. the last war was that hundred year war because King yeah. was like, and then you need a weapon and you need a weapon and you need a weapon. <laughs> that one that happened yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. the one yeah yeah i'm connecting now all right so that is kenneth east so those are the three houses of kenneth now all right real quick question for you joe out of the three leaders which one would you follow i think merrick's he feels the most stable of course yeah so i, I could zorlon just is too dark right like zorlon like he's a he's he's a he's he's like the ends justify the means kind of thing because we know necromancy right how do you get like how do you generate the negative energy to create the undead you kill somebody right they're doing human sacrifices over there what's your um, point, <laughs> what's your point? <laughs> uh, uh necromancers can also reach through the uh the veil and there's a manifest zone uh down there so right and so he he's so I I told you in in a religion one that uh, all souls go to the realm of the dead right and and that's actually really thin um in Eberron the the veil between Dolor uh, and Eberron aha uh-huh. and uh uh the reason those souls fade away are because necromancers reach into there and they use a piece of their soul for their mm. necromancy Nancy. so that's why the souls eventually just fade away. Yeah, yeah. So, so the liches. So yeah. So so Zorlan, he's got a dark. He's he's, he's kind of like doesn't care how and then, he gets and, what he wants. And then Zorlan, she's just, just, she just, just thinking trust. with her pants. No, she's yeah, just thinking with her always, pants. Always <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean you can't trust? You can trust that she's going to be a really good leader <laughs> unless there's a cute boy. Yes, <laughs> and then it's like, out the is, window. Yeah, she's a great leader unless there's a cute boy, and then it just doesn't matter. <laughs> Guys, that's going to be like, <laughs> I'm going to start saying that. Well, both of my sisters are married, so I can't say it to them. But like female friends, if they're just being dumb, just like, ah, oh, man, you're being such a Chorlandi right now. <laughs> you're thinking with your so, pants. All right. So let's talk about the actual dragon marks as you play the game. So we'll talk about 3.5. We'll talk about 5e. And then we'll talk about the Arcana Unearthed. How much okay. time do you think you're going to set aside for this? Not much. Okay. I'll give you two minutes. I'll give you two minutes. Okay. So um, in 3.5, you could get uh, a, a bonus to your crafting, making, and tool use of a D4 if you had a dragon mark. And then the least mark, yeah, you could do you could cast uh, make once a day, mending twice a day, or repair light damage once a day, and uh, a, an additional two plus two on your crafting checks. Um, and so, and like I said, in, in 3.5, you would take three feats, right? Feet one is the least mark, feet two is the lesser mark, and feet three would be the greater mark. Now, in 3.5, there's a lot more feats, so you can take a lot more. I know it's not oh. as big a deal, right? Whereas in, in 5e, feats are very rare, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And so then at the, at the lesser mark, you could do minor creation once a day or repair serious damage once a day. And then at the greater mark, you could fabricate once a day or do a major creation once a day. Okay. And, uh, and these are names of spells uh, yeah these are names are, of spells yeah that's what yeah. these are these essentially they they allow you to cast these spells using your mark 
Right, um, and they're they're casted as cantrips. You can do them as many times as you. Can. No, 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 because it's it's a number of times a day, one a day, oh, two is a day. It? Yeah. Oh, oh, this is three. Okay, yeah. So, um, the plus the 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 D four bonus to your tools, and then the plus two on your craft checks. That's where you enhance the artificer with the with the dragon mark. But the spells these are just spells from the artificer list, so it could allow you to diversify. Um, and whatnot, but you know, not a huge bonus to you as an artificer. But I mean, there in in three point five, each feat never gives you a lot. It's always just a, just a little bit, and then they start to stack as you build them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and then five e, you get plus two int or plus one to a different stat, and you get to choose a tool proficiency. So you're getting you definitely get more because feats are rarer and harder to come by. But I guess it's not a feat in five e. It's like a it's part of your race. Right, where you pick there. Um, and then you would get access to spells on a spell list that you could use spell slots for. So identify, tensor floating disc, continual flame, magic weapon, conjure barrage, elemental weapon, fabricate, stone shape, and creation. Now, for me, looking at the Artificer in 5.0, it's like it's really almost like a subclass in Artificer. Like if you're actually playing an Artificer, you don't really get anything out of it, right? You already get these things being an Artificer. Yeah, yeah. And, I've heard you complain about this. Before. And yeah, so I, I have complained about this <laughs> before because it's like in the lore of the game, artificers with the mark of making are super creators, right? Right. right. Just making awesome, incredible things. Whereas playing an artificer with the mark of making in 5e is like, you're an artificer and most of these abilities overlap, so you're really not getting anything out of your dragon mark. You're like, right, you're no! I am supposed to be a demigod of creation! Uh, so what you're saying is basically, if you're going to play 5e, you've got to homebrew the artificer class. Well, that's where we're going to get into the Arcana Unearthed. Uh, Whatever that means. Okay, so... It's Arch- a book! It's a book, yeah. So the first version was done by Gary Gygax in 1985. So, of course, it did not include artificers. But Wizards yeah. of the Coast released an updated version in 2004. Now, this was for 3.5, but most people are bringing this into 5e because it really expands the artificer. And what's it called? For making. This Arcana Unearthed Arcana is the book. Unearthed. So within it, uh, the artificer, I mean, the dragon mark gives you plus one in either intelligence or dex. You gain the artisan intuition, which is anytime you are doing anything with tools, crafting, or making, you roll a d4 and you add that to whatever nice. your roll is. Mm-hmm. Uh, you get the maker's gift, which gives you the mending cantrips. So you can use them to mend things as many times mm-hmm. you want as a day. Um, And then you get the mage craft uh, ability, which you can, so you pick a spell from the wizard's cantrip list, and then essentially you create an item that will produce that cantrip uh, as many times as you want, and it will only last for a day, and then you can make a new one the next day. So you're using this little creation to make whatever cantrip you want for the day. Mm Mm-hmm. And then you have the Spellsmith, which you can use to give plus one to armor. I should say plus additional one to any weapon or armor once a day. Wow. And that comes from the Arcana Unearthed. And for me, that really enhances you. Like that, that is what makes you a dragon marked artificer is the Arcana Unearthed. So like I said, it was made for 3.5. But a lot of people bring it into 5e because then instead of just being like a subclass, it's actually enhancing you as an artificer. Gotcha. I can see that. Very nice. All right. So there it is. The House Caneth and the Dragon Mark of Making. I'm going to have to get that book because I want to play an artificer eventually. <laughs> I have a friend. Show. I have a friend who's playing an artificer and uh, a lot of times he comes to me for ideas. Like the one time he's, he's like, he's like, so what should I make? And so I found a video on YouTube of a guy who created an auto aiming bow. I was like, first make this. It's like auto aiming bow. Yes. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I found something and it was uh, the guys, the guy was uh, he's, he, he's, he's like, so I asked my DM if I could either stitch spell scrolls together or make the writing really tiny to get a bunch of spells onto one scroll. And he's like, <laughs> why? And I, I told him, no big reason. And then it's, it's got an image. And he's like, the big reason. And the guy's got like a Gatlin gun. 
<laughs> casting the scrolls as they spin through. So uh-huh. he's just like shooting out spells like it's a machine gun. He's <laughs> like, on this turn, I will do five fireballs and two scorching rays. <laughs> oh, no, I would just go hardcore magic missiles. Oh, that would be good. Yeah, <laughs> be if, like, if I can pop round, off six magic missiles in a turn. Each round, yeah. Pop, 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 pop. Like, like they're decimated. You yeah. know, Joe would do six uh, fireballs per turn. Of course he would. <laughs> All of his uh, teammates would be bad. Uh, as bad, a sorcerer, just... I'd be shooting six fireballs. But as a wizard, I would look at the mob and be like, what ammo do I want? <laughs> I guess that makes sense. Uh, let's talk about this more in the uh, treasure room, actually. All right. All right. Yeah. Also, we have a Discord. We've talked about this briefly. Mm-hmm. Redbeard is taking care of it, but we are in there very often, especially on weekends. We're playing games. We actually want to know. Uh, we'd actually love for you to hop in with us and come play with us because we play a lot of different games. Um, and tell your friends to come join us. Come play with us. It'll be fun. And then uh, if you enjoyed this episode and you just want more, join us in the treasure room. We're going to go record that right now. Yeah. See you there. So uh, you have just been floored. Now go floor your friends. Thanks for listening. Leave us a review. Tell us why you like listening to us. Is it our awesome deep dives? Is it our amazing back and forth? Is it our charming good looks? What would you like us to add or change? You can put that in the review as well. We read reviews. Yeah, and if you're going to be leaving us a review telling us what you like about it, maybe you even want to share the content with your friends. Uh, Like and share on social media. You can join us on Twitter and Facebook. We post memes. And we actually started a Discord, so come play with us. So uh, a lot of the worlds we cover have a retcon. Uh, If you're not familiar with that term, it's reconstruction. Or sometimes we might uh, use a bad source for some of our lore research. And if that happens, uh, feel free to email us at floorfantasyandlore at gmail.com. That is floor spelled F-L-O-R-E, fantasyandlore at gmail.com. And if you're angry enough, we'll read it on the air. (laughs) Yes, we will. Also, the treasure room is now available. We have locked a few secrets for everything we cover in there. And each week... We add more. And uh, you can find the treasure room on patreon.com backslash floor fantasy and lore. And how do you spell that, Aaron? That's lore with an F at the beginning. So it sounds like floor, but it's not the floor you're thinking because it's our floor. And, uh, we hope you enjoyed your time on the floor. Uh, think about your favorite part of the episode. Now think about your nerdiest friend. Who is it? What is their name? They want to know about the floor. Stop holding out on them. Go and tell them about your favorite part. Because all of this is more fun together.